In these lectures, I have tried to answer what are to me some of the most worrisome questions about how we as human beings fit into the rest of the universe. Our conception of ourselves as free agents is fundamental to our overall self-conception. Now, ideally, I would like to be able to keep both my common sense conceptions and my scientific beliefs. In the case of the relation between mind and body, for example, I was able to do that. But when it comes to the question of freedom and determinism, I am, like a lot of other philosophers, unable to reconcile the two. One would think that after over 2,000 years of worrying about it, the problem of the freedom of the will would by now have been finally solved. Well, actually, most philosophers think it has been solved. They think it was solved by Thomas Hobbes and David Hume and various other empirically-minded philosophers whose solutions have been repeated and improved right into the 20th century. I think it has not been solved. In this lecture, I want to give you an account of what the problem is and why the contemporary solution is not a solution, and then conclude by trying to explain why the problem is likely to stay with us. On the one hand, we're inclined to say that since nature consists of particles and their relations with each other, and since everything can be accounted for in terms of those particles and their relations, there is simply no room for freedom of the will. As far as human freedom is concerned, it doesn't matter whether physics is deterministic, as Newtonian physics was, or whether it allows for randomness or indeterminacy at the level of particle physics, as contemporary quantum mechanics does. Indeterminism at the level of particles in physics is really no support at all to any doctrine of the freedom of the will. Because first, the statistical indeterminacy at the level of particles does not show any indeterminacy at the level of the objects that matter to us, human bodies, for example. And secondly, even if there is an element of indeterminacy in the behavior of physical particles, even if they are only statistically predictable, Still, that by itself gives no scope for human freedom of the will. It doesn't follow from the fact that particles are only statistically determined that the human mind can force the statistically determined particles to swerve from their paths. The strongest image for conveying this conception of determinism is still that formulated by Laplace. If an ideal observer knew the positions of all the particles at a given instant and knew all the laws governing their movements, he could predict and retrodict the entire history of the universe. Some of the predictions of a contemporary quantum mechanical Laplace might be statistical, but they would still allow no room for freedom of the will. Well, so much for the appeal of determinism. Now let's turn to the argument for the freedom of the will. As many philosophers have pointed out, if there is any fact of experience that we are all familiar with, it's the simple fact that our own choices, decisions, reasonings, and cogitations seem to make a difference to our actual behavior. There are all sorts of experiences that we have in life where it seems just a fact of our experience that though we did one thing, we know, or at least think we know perfectly well, that we could have done something else. We know we could have done something else because we chose one thing for certain reasons. But we were aware that there were also reasons for choosing something else, and indeed we might have acted on those reasons and chosen that something else. Another way to put this point is to say it's just a plain empirical fact about our behavior that it isn't predictable in the way that the behavior of objects rolling down an inclined plane is predictable. And the reason it isn't predictable in that way is that we could often do otherwise than we in fact did. Human freedom is just a fact of experience, and if we want some empirical proof of this fact, we can simply point to the further fact that it's always up to us to falsify any predictions that anybody might care to make about our behavior. If somebody predicts that I'm going to do something, I might just damn well do something else. Now, that sort of option is simply not open to glaciers moving down mountainsides or balls rolling down inclined planes or the planets moving in their elliptical orbits. This is a characteristic philosophical conundrum. On the one hand, a set of very powerful arguments forces to the conclusion that free will has no place in the universe. On the other hand, a series of powerful arguments based on facts of our own experience 
inclines us to the conclusion that there must be some freedom of the will because we all experience it all the time. Now, there's a standard solution to this philosophical conundrum. According to this solution, free will and determinism are perfectly compatible with each other. Of course, according to this solution, everything in the world is determined, but some actions are nonetheless free. To say that they are free is not to deny that they are determined. It's just to say that they are not constrained. We're not forced to do them. So, for example, if a man is forced to do something at gunpoint, or if he's suffering from some psychological compulsion, then his behavior is genuinely unfree. But if, on the other hand, he freely acts, if he acts, as we say, of his own free will, then his behavior is free. Of course, it's also completely determined, since every aspect of his behavior is determined by the physical forces operating on the particles that compose his body, as they operate on all of the bodies in the universe. So, according to this view, free behavior exists, but it's just a small corner of the determined world. It's that corner of determined behavior where certain kinds of force and compulsion are absent. Now, because this view asserts the compatibility of free will and determinism, it's usually called simply compatibilism. I think it's inadequate as a solution to the problem, and here's why. The problem about the freedom of the will is not about whether or not there are inner psychological reasons that cause us to do things, as well as external physical causes and inner compulsions. Rather, it's about whether or not the causes of our behavior, whatever they are, are sufficient to determine the behavior so that things have to happen the way they do happen. And there's another way to put this problem. Is it ever true to say of a person that he could have done otherwise, all other conditions remaining the same? For example, given that a person chose to vote for the Tories, could he have chosen to vote for one of the other parties, all other conditions remaining the same? Now, compatibilism doesn't really answer that question in a way that allows any scope for the ordinary notion of the freedom of the will. What it says is that all behavior is determined in such a way that it couldn't have occurred otherwise, all other conditions remaining the same. Everything that happened was indeed determined. It's just that some things were determined by certain sorts of inner psychological causes, those which we call our reasons for acting, and not by external forces or psychological compulsions. So we're still left with a problem. Is it ever true to say of a human being that he could have done otherwise? Compatibilism, in short, denies the substance of free will while maintaining its verbal shell. Well, then, let's try to make a fresh start. I said that we have a conviction of our own free will simply based on the facts of human experience. But perhaps our belief that such experiences support the doctrine of human freedom is illusory. Consider this sort of example. A typical hypnosis experiment has the following form. Under hypnosis, the patient is given a post-hypnotic suggestion. You can tell him, for example, to do some fairly trivial, harmless thing, such as, let's say, crawl around on the floor. Now, after the patient comes out of hypnosis, he might be engaging in conversation, sitting, drinking coffee, when suddenly he says something like, what a fascinating floor in this room, or I want to check out this rug, or I'm thinking of investing in floor coverings, and I'd like to investigate the coverings on this floor. And he then proceeds to crawl around on the floor. Now, the interest of these cases is that the patient always gives some more or less adequate reason for doing what he does. That is, he seems to himself to be behaving freely. We, on the other hand, have good reasons to believe that his behavior isn't free at all, that the reasons he gives for his apparent decision to crawl around on the floor are irrelevant, that his behavior was determined in advance, that he is, in short, in the grip of a post-hypnotic suggestion. Now, one way to pose the problem of determinism, or at least one important aspect of the problem of determinism, is, is all human behavior like that? But now, if we take that example seriously, it looks as if it proves to be an argument for the freedom of the will and not against it. The agent thought he was acting freely, though in fact his behavior was determined. 
But it seems empirically very unlikely that all human behavior is like that. Sometimes people are indeed suffering from the effects of hypnosis, and sometimes we know that they're in the grip of unconscious urges which they cannot control. But are they always like that? Is all human behavior determined by such psychological compulsions? The thesis of psychological determinism is that prior psychological causes determine all of our behavior in the way that they determine the behavior of the hypnosis subject or the heroin addict. On this view, all behavior in one way or another is psychologically compulsive, but the available evidence suggests that such a thesis is false. We do indeed normally act on the basis of our intentional states, our beliefs, hopes, fears, desires, and so on. And in that sense, our mental states function causally. But this form of cause and effect relation is not deterministic. We might have had exactly those mental states and still not have done what we did. Instances of hypnosis and psychologically compulsive behavior on the one hand are usually pathological and easily distinguishable from normal free action on the other. So psychologically speaking, there does seem to be scope for human freedom. But is this solution really an advance on compatibilism? Aren't we just saying, once again, yes, all behavior is determined, but what we call free behavior is the sort determined by rational thought processes. Sometimes the conscious, rational thought processes don't make any difference, as in the hypnosis case, and sometimes they do, as in the normal case. But, of course, those normal, rational thought processes are as much determined as anything else. So, once again, don't we have the result that everything we do was entirely written in the book of history billions of years before we were born, and therefore nothing we do is free in any philosophically interesting sense. If we choose to call our behavior free, that's just a matter of adopting a traditional terminology, just as we continue to speak of sunsets even though we know perfectly well that the sun doesn't literally set. So we continue to speak of acting of our own free will, even though there is no such phenomenon. One way to examine a philosophical thesis, or any other kind of a thesis for that matter, is to ask, what difference would it make? How would the world be any different if that thesis were true, as opposed to how the world would be if that thesis were false? Now, part of the appeal of determinism, I believe, is that it seems to be consistent with the way the world in fact proceeds, at least as far as we know anything about it from physics. That is, if determinism were true, then the world would proceed pretty much the way it does proceed, the only difference being that certain of our beliefs about its proceedings would be false. But if libertarianism, that is the thesis of free will, were true, it appears we would have to make some really radical changes in our beliefs about the world. In order for us to have radical freedom, then it looks as if we would have to postulate that inside each of us was a self that was capable of interfering with the causal order of nature. That is, it looks as if we would have to contain some entity that was capable of making molecules swerve from their paths. I don't know if such a view is even intelligible, but it's certainly not consistent with what we know about how the world works from physics, and there's not the slightest evidence to suppose that we should abandon physical theory in favor of such a view. Well, so far, then, we seem to be getting exactly nowhere in our effort to resolve the conflict between determinism and the belief in the freedom of the will. Science seems to allow no place for freedom of the will, and indeterminism in physics offers no support for the freedom of the will. On the other hand, we seem to be unable to give up the belief in the freedom of the will. So let's investigate both of these points a bit further. Why exactly is there no room for the freedom of the will on the contemporary scientific view of the universe? Our basic explanatory mechanisms in physics work from the bottom up. That is to say, we explain the behavior of surface features of a phenomenon such as the transparency of glass or the liquidity of water, in terms of the behavior of microparticles, such as molecules. And the relation of the mind to the brain is an example of such a relation. 
But we get causation from the mind to the body. That is, we get top-down causation over a passage of time. And we get top-down causation over time because the top level and the bottom level go together. So, for example, suppose I want to cause the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine at the axon endplates of my motor neurons. Now, I can do that by simply deciding to raise my arm and then raising it. Here, the mental event, the intention to raise my arm, causes the physical event, the release of acetylcholine. And that's a case of top-down causation, if ever there was one. But such cases of top-down causation only work because the mental events are grounded in the neurophysiology to start with. So corresponding to the description of the causal relations that go from the top to the bottom, there's another description of the same series of events where the causal relations bounce entirely along the bottom. That is, they are entirely a matter of neurons and neuron firings at synapses and so on. Now, as long as we accept this conception of how nature works, then it doesn't seem that there's any scope for the freedom of the will, because on this conception, the mind can only affect nature insofar as it is already a part of nature. But if so, then like the rest of nature, its features are determined at the basic micro-levels of physics. This is actually an absolutely fundamental point in this lecture, so let me repeat it. The form of determinism that is ultimately worrisome is not psychological determinism. The idea that our states of mind are sufficient to determine everything we do is probably just false. The worrisome form of determinism is more basic and fundamental. Since all of the surface features of the world are entirely caused by and realized in systems of micro-elements, then the behavior of micro-elements is sufficient to determine everything that happens. Such a bottom-up picture of the world allows for top-down causation. Our minds, for example, can affect our bodies. But the top-down causation only works because the top level is already caused by and realized in the bottom levels. Well, then, let's turn to the next obvious question. What is it about our experience that makes it impossible for us to abandon the belief in the freedom of the will? If freedom is an illusion, why is it an illusion we seem unable to abandon? The first thing to notice about our conception of human freedom is that it is essentially tied to consciousness. We only attribute freedom to conscious beings. Suppose, for example, somebody built a robot which we believe to be totally unconscious. In such a case, we would never feel any inclination to call it free. Even if we found its behavior random and unpredictable, we would not say that it was acting freely in the sense that we think of ourselves as acting freely. If, on the other hand, somebody built a robot that we became convinced had consciousness, in the same sense that we do, then it would at least be an open question whether or not that robot had freedom of the will. The second point to note is that it is not just any state of consciousness that gives us the conviction of human freedom. If life consisted entirely of the reception of passive perceptions, then it seems to me we would never so much as form the idea of human freedom. If you imagine yourself totally immobile, totally unable to move, and unable to determine even the course of your own thoughts, but still receiving stimuli, for example, say, periodic, mildly painful sensations, there would not in such a case be the slightest inclination to conclude that you had freedom of the will. I said earlier that most philosophers think that the conviction of human freedom is somehow essentially tied to the process of rational decision-making. But I think that's only partly true. In fact, weighing up reasons is only a very special case of the experiences that give us the conviction of freedom. The characteristic experience that gives us the conviction of human freedom, and it is an experience from which we are unable to strip away the conviction of freedom, is the experience of engaging in voluntary, intentional human actions. Now, it's that sort of experience which is the foundation stone of our belief in the freedom of the will. Why? 
Reflect very carefully on the character of the experiences you have as you engage in normal, everyday, ordinary human actions. You will sense the possibility of alternative courses of action built into these experiences. If you raise your arm or walk across the room or take a drink of water, you will see that at any point in the experience you have a sense of alternative courses of action open to you. If one tried to express it in words, the difference between the experience of perceiving and the experience of acting is that in perceiving one has the sense, this is happening to me. But in acting, one has the sense, I am making this happen. But the sense that I am making this happen carries with it the sense, I could be doing something else. In normal behavior, each thing we do carries the conviction, valid or invalid, that we could be doing something else right here and now. That is, all other conditions remaining the same. And this, I submit, is the source of our unshakable conviction in our own free will. It is perhaps important to emphasize that I'm discussing normal human action. If one is in the grip of a great passion, for example, if one is in the grip of a great rage, one loses this sense of freedom, and one can even be surprised to discover what one is doing. Now, once we notice this feature of the experience of acting, a great deal of the puzzling phenomena I mentioned earlier is easily explained. Why, for example, do we feel that the man in the case of post-hypnotic suggestion is not acting freely in the sense in which we are, even though he might think that he is acting freely? Well, the reason is that in an important sense, he doesn't know what he's doing. His actual intention in action is totally unconscious. The options that he sees as available to him are irrelevant to the actual motivation of his behavior. Notice also that the compatibilist examples of so-called forced or compelled behavior still, in many cases, involve the experience of freedom. If, for example, I'm instructed to walk across the room at gunpoint, still part of the experience is that I sense that it's literally open to me at any step to do something else. The experience of freedom is thus an essential component of any case of acting with an intention. Again, you can see this if you contrast the normal case of action with the Penfield cases where stimulation of the motor cortex produces an involuntary movement of the arm or leg. In such a case, the patient would experience the movement passively as he would experience a sound or a sensation of pain. Unlike intentional actions, there are no options built into this experience. To see this point clearly, try to imagine that a portion of your life was like the Penfield experiments on a grand scale. Instead of walking across the room, you simply find that your body is moving across the room. Instead of speaking, you simply hear and feel words coming out of your mouth. Imagine your experiences are those of a purely passive but conscious puppet, and you will have imagined away the experience of freedom. But in the typical case of intentional action, there's no way we can carve off the experience of freedom. It is an essential part of the experience of acting. This also explains, I believe, why we cannot give up our conviction of freedom. We find it easy enough to give up the conviction that the earth is flat as soon as we understand the evidence for the heliocentric theory of the solar system. Similarly, when we look at a sunset, in spite of appearances, we do not feel compelled to believe that the sun is setting behind the earth. We believe that the appearance of the sun setting is simply an illusion created by the rotation of the earth. In each case, it is possible to give up a common sense conviction because the hypothesis that replaces it both accounts for the experiences that led to that conviction in the first place as well as explaining a whole lot of other facts that the common sense view is unable to account for. Now, that's why we give up the belief in a flat earth and literal sunsets in favor of the Copernican conception of the solar system. But we can't similarly give up the conviction of freedom because that conviction is built into every normal, conscious, intentional action. And indeed, we use this conviction in identifying and explaining actions. 
we can now draw the conclusions that are implicit in this discussion. First, if the worry about determinism is a worry that all of our behavior is in fact psychologically compulsive, then it appears that the worry is unwarranted. Insofar as psychological determinism is just an empirical hypothesis like any other, then the evidence we presently have available to us suggests it is false. So this does give us a modified form of compatibilism. It gives us the view that psychological libertarianism is compatible with physical determinism. Secondly, it even gives us a sense of could have in which people's behavior, though determined, is such that in that sense they could have done otherwise. The sense is simply that as far as the psychological factors were concerned, they could have done otherwise. The notions of ability, of what we're able to do and what we could have done, are often relative to some such set of criteria. For example, I could have voted for Carter in the 1980 American election, even if I didn't, but I could not have voted for George Washington. He was not a candidate. So there's a sense of could have in which there were a range of choices available to me, and in that sense, there were a lot of things I could have done, all other things being equal, which I did not, in fact, do. Now, similarly, because the psychological factors operating on me do not always, or even in general, compel me to behave in a particular fashion, I often, psychologically speaking, could have done something different from what I did, in fact, do. But third, this form of compatibilism still does not give us anything like the resolution of the conflict between freedom and determinism that our urge to radical libertarianism really demands. As long as we accept the bottom-up conception of physical explanation, and it's a conception on which the past 300 years of science is based, then psychological facts about ourselves, like any other higher-level facts, are entirely causally explicable in terms of, and entirely realized in systems of, elements at the fundamental microphysical level. Our conception of physical reality simply does not allow for radical freedom. Fourth and finally, for reasons that I don't really understand, evolution has given us a form of experience of voluntary action where the experience of freedom, that is to say, the experience of the sense of alternative possibilities, is built into the very structure of conscious, voluntary, intentional human behavior. For that reason, I believe neither this discussion nor any other will ever convince us that our behavior is unfree. My aim in these lectures has been to try to characterize the relationships between the conception that we have of ourselves as rational, free, conscious, mindful agents with a conception that we have of the world as consisting of mindless, meaningless, physical particles. It's tempting to think that just as we have discovered that large portions of common sense do not adequately represent how the world really works, so we might also discover that our conception of ourselves and our behavior is entirely false. But there are limits on this possibility. The distinction between reality and appearance cannot apply to the very existence of consciousness. For if it seems to me that I'm conscious, then I am conscious we could discover all kinds of startling things about ourselves and our behavior, but we cannot discover that we do not have minds, that they do not contain conscious, subjective, intentionalistic mental states, nor could we discover that we do not at least try to engage in voluntary, intentional actions. The problem I've set myself is not to prove the existence of these things, but to examine their status and their implications for our conceptions of the rest of nature. My general theme has been that with certain important exceptions, our common sense conception of ourselves is perfectly consistent with our conception of nature as a physical system.